Division Manager for Sierra District State Parks. I'm so thrilled that you're here. Uh, this is a collaborative effort with the Sierra State Parks Foundation and California State Parks and some co-sponsors that we're going to measure, or that we're going to mention. Uh, so we packed this place. Give it up for you guys for coming out today. Uh, so the goal of this Sierra Speaker Series is to connect our community to the rich natural and cultural history of this region. So we're so grateful for your support. We hope to offer a lot more programs like this. We're expanding this series, and so there's more good stuff to come. Um, so right now I'd like to bring up Hi Rotha first. Yeah. Let's have Rotha. Get it Rotha Carlson. <laughs> I just wanted to take the, uh, the brief opportunity to say what a pleasure it's been to partner with the State Parks and the Sierra Parks Foundation. It seems like it's a perfect partnership because we have the local community and the, um, the history that we can share and just get everybody involved with. We also have wonderful co-sponsors with the Truck and Donner Historical Society. With, I don't know what I'd do without them. The Golden Drift Historical Society is part of the evening as well. And the Chinese American Museum of Northern California. Thank you all for being here. I just have one little shout out thing. Save the date, May 10th, Friday, May 10th, 2024, because we're celebrating the placement by the Truckee Donner Historical Society of plaques designating Truckee's two Chinatowns. So you've got plenty of opportunities. <laughs> We're the nonprofit partner with eight California State Parks in Lake Tahoe and Donner. And when we opened this visitor center seven years ago, we can only imagine um, the continuation of this beautiful event that we're having today. So thank you so much for your support of the nonprofits that, that are the engine um, of, of California State Parks, our wonderful state park partners, and most important um, to our wonderful speakers who have really elevated what we're doing um, into our community. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeremy, who will be introducing our speaker. <laughs> I'll introduce Heidi again. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and I was worried because, okay, so our furnace broke for our heater in this building, and I was worried that it was going to be way too too cold in here. How's everyone's temperature doing? But I think we have enough people here that we're kind of heating this place up a little bit. So I can open that door if it gets too too toasty, but there's no heat at all in this, and I think that's the way it should be. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So I'm going to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. So Dr. Sue Fon Chung. Let's welcome Dr. Sue Fon Chung. Dr. Chung is Professor of History Emerita at UNLV, one of, the most na one of the nation's most lauded authorities on the history of the Chinese in the West. She's the author of numerous books and articles and an advisor to multiple national and regional organizations. She's from Los Angeles and received her PhD from UC Berkeley. And again, please help me welcome Professor Sue Fon Chung. Thank you so much, Jeremy. If you can't hear me in the back, just wave your hand and then I'll try to speak louder. Oh, you can't hear me? We're oh, good. You're good, okay, okay. Usually in the classroom, you know, I'm fine like this without a mic. So when Jeremy asked if I wanted a mic, I said, I don't think so. But anyway, I'd like to thank you all for coming and giving up your evening uh, for this adventure because it is an adventure. And I'd also like to welcome several of the descendants of the Central Pacific Railroad Railroad, if you'd like to raise your hand. And I, I'd also like to welcome the descendants, Mr. and Mrs. McLaslin, uh, descendants of that very famous Charles McLaslin, editor of the Truckee Republican, whom you'll hear about tonight. Would you raise your hand? Oh, they're going to hide. Okay. They're here, but they're hiding. Okay. So, shall we start, Jeremy? He's going to turn off the lights. Aren't you going to? Yeah, okay. Oh, dear. It's not. 
Jeremy, it's not working. <laughs> Should I do it on the computer? What? It's not working. Oh, it's not working. He's got me. Famous clicker. We like to build dramatic suspense here. <laughs> we just had it working. <laughs> we had it working. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right, we're in business. All right. <laughs> we all. Okay. Whenever we talk about immigrants, oh, my, my goal today is to correct some misunderstandings and misperceptions that people have about what history has been about, especially with the Chinese, and especially about the Chinese in Truckee. So we're, although we're focusing on Truckee, we're going to put the Chinese experience of Truckee into a larger context. Whenever we look at immigrants, we have to look at where they come from. And the, the Chinese immigrants came from China, a country that was larger than the United States, one of the most populous countries in the world at that time, with 350 million people. Uh, about uh, there was one American to every four Chinese, and so there used to be a, a joke, you know, don't have more than three children because your fourth one will be Chinese. <laughs> And we, we see that they came primarily from South China. And so where is South China? Well, today's Chinese will say anything from Shanghai down is South China. Here's, oh, well, anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> now we're, oh, no, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> That okay, so what we see is this is the South China from Shanghai down to Guangzhou in the bottom. Guangzhou is better known as Canton. I'll get there eventually by the end of the lecture. No, it's not going to go down. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> no, but, but there's one more. Okay, go back to one, that stuff. Okay, so in this one little province, and there are 50 states in the United States and 18 provinces in China, so you know that this is a large area. In this little space is the area where 90% of the Chinese to the United States came from. And they came from these different areas. The green area was called the four counties or four districts uh, and provided most of the immigrants to the United States. The purple and yellow area is a more urban China, Chinese area and they were the earliest to come to the United States. The Guangzhou is also known as Canton in red was one of the immigration that is places to leave China as well as Hong Kong and Macau. And so one of the reasons why Jung San is shown in yellow is because a lot of the immigrants who exited through Macau to the United States came that way. But you see that Taishan is green and by the ocean, and they will send a lot of people by junks uh, over to the United States. Now, most of the the people that came to the United States from China were farmers, at least that was the main uh, American image of them. And so here is a typical farm that I went to visit, and you can see that they were hard workers, um, planting all year round, working hard, and they followed the Confucian philosophy. And this is important to understand that Confucianism is not a religion, it is a way of life. It's, it's a, a belief system in family and Confucian principles. And the Confucian social status that was established in the fourth century BC was that scholars officials were at the top of society because they were the leaders of society. Peasants and farmers were second because they fed the society. Artisans such as doctors, soldiers, and so forth helped these people uh, permit society to function. And finally, there were the merchants, who were the self-interest 
interested people and therefore at the bottom of the social scale. So coming to the United States, you have a reversal of values that's going to be hard to deal with. Well, what was going on in China at the time? China was ruled by the Manchu nomads from the north since 1644, and they will fall in 1911. But they couldn't control China. There was a lot of banditry. There was a lot of peasant rebellions. There was a lot of flooding and famine, which caused people to be starving. The population growth was such that people had to sell their farms and become tenant farmers. It was a terrible situation. They sold their children in order to feed the children that they had. Um, um, and, and then, at the same time, China began to lose wars to the foreign uh, powers, including Britain, who then used to say, if I could make one inch of a Chinaman's coattail, we'd be rich for generations. And so we see that cotton cloth is being imported to China, flour and other things as well. And it's putting any of the local village cotton weavers out of jobs, cotton dyers, cotton iron, cotton salespeople. So all of this is going to have an effect on what goes on in the United States. Also, they began to denude the forests in order to plant tea to sell to the Western world, including that tea that was dumped in the Boston Harbor. <laughs> Well, why did they go, why did the Chinese leave? Well, they wanted to get money for the people at home. And they wanted new economic opportunities and the ability to send the money home. So what did they send it for? Well, to build better houses, to build watchtowers, to, to protect the, um, oh dear, to protect the people. And so, Here's a watchtower on the left, and you see the new homes on, on your left side, the watchtower on your right side. And we know that they sent about $110 million in 1903, but as the Chinese in the United States prospered in 1937, they sent $517 million back home to build schools, hospitals, trains, all kinds of things to help China prosper. Oh, I'm going the wrong way again. Okay, what does a typical village look like? This is Sandung Village, which Stanford helped modernize in a way, in an interesting way. They did an archeological study of it. And what we found was that there were a lot of American goods in this village. So the people who lived in America were sending things back to the village, foodstuffs, dishes, uh, pottery instruments, uh, and so forth, as well as ideas, architectural style, but, you know, really radical things like you should get married for love and not because your parents tell you to. You know, it, uh, all these kinds of things that you don't want to deal with. And you see that this is a typical village with feng shui or geomancy with hills in the background and water in the foreground. And the water in the foreground is where they had their fresh fish. So the southern Chinese love fresh fish and fresh seafood. Oops. So what does, oh, here we go again. What does a home look like? Well, this is the home of, of Henry Yup, who lived in Reno. He was actually born in China. His great-grandfather worked on the Central Pacific, and his great-grandfather went back, sent his son over, and they kept coming back and forth. So at the age of 12, they sent Henry to the United States. He served in World War II, but before that, he went home uh, in 1937, got married, had a daughter, built this house for her, and then decided that she needed protection, so he built a double part of the house for his brother so that he would protect his sister-in-law and child. And it wasn't until 1943 that with the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act that he could bring his wife and daughter to the United States and to Reno. And by that time, he owned two or three restaurants in the Reno area and one in California. And then eventually, they had 10 children total, and all of them graduated from college, some of them going to UNR, of course. Well, taking the trip from Canton to San Francisco was long and arduous. Uh, most of them people came from Guangdong province, but a few from nearby Fujian province. And they'll make this long trip to the American West, which could take... Ooh, 
30 to 60 days uh, if you traveled by steamship or sailboat and you would st you would travel by steerage class and many of them traveled on the Pacific Mail Steamship Company or its predecessor the Orient Occidental and Oriental both of them being headed by Leland Stanford one of the big four of the Central Pacific as well as being founder of the Stanford University. Now some uh, sailed on boats, sailboats, junks, and this is very interesting. It took maybe three to six months and this was the least expensive way to get to the United States, but also the most dangerous. And once you got to the coast, the Pacific coastline, you spotted where your fellow regional provincial person was there. In other words, if I sailed into California, I would look for other people who came from California who were docked there. And they could tell this because the ships from each province differed. They had some slight difference that made them distinctive to the people so that they knew, for example, in Monterey Bay, that most of the ships docked there were from uh, Jongsan. Well, they got to San Francisco, which was the first big port, and San Francisco in 1849, of course, was booming, and the city councils said, you can't live in tents here, you have to build buildings, and you have to have wooden buildings or more permanent buildings, and so by 1851, it was a very prosperous looking place, but many of the houses in San Francisco and throughout the northern, northern California area were built by Chinese with um, you might say put together houses from China and they had carpenters who would put together these houses called China houses that had no nails it was, you know like a Lincoln log set that you did and we see them scattered all over at the same time we have a growing population of Chinese 77% uh, of the Chinese in the United States lived in California the population in 18... 60 was about 35,000, then it grew in 1870. 1880 was the high point with 75,000, then it slowly dropped in 1890 and dropped further in 1900 and even further as time passed. Well, the real attraction to the American West was gold, and it was discovered in 1849, as most of you know, and here's a picture of a Chinese miner in 1860 with his long Tom, which you used for mining, carried on a shoulder pole. And they would carry heavy objects on a shoulder pole. Like if they needed a stove, an iron stove, it would split in half and they carried one half on one end and the other half the other end. And so here you see some Chinese working with non-Chinese miners. This is a long time that is now situated and they're doing the mining. Some, many of the mining areas, mining districts, prohibited the Chinese from uh, logging a claim. And so they went into partnerships with Euro-Americans to own the claim or to work the claim. And we see this also scattered throughout the American West. The Chinese tended to work in groups of 25 to 30 with a headman and a cook. The cook always made more money than the rest of the people, <laughs> other than the headman, because, you know, food is really important. And if they were in isolated places, they tended to join an association basically for protection, but also for recreation, somebody to interact with, because they no longer had the family that was so crucial to their lives in China. Few of them had lo wives living in the United States with them, because of the 1875 Page Law, which required women to prove to the American consul in Hong Kong that they were not a prostitute. So imagine yourself as a farm wife in Canton area, and you, had, you didn't know any English, and you had to go to the American consulate in Hong Kong, and you had to prove that you were not a prostitute. Not that you were married, but that you were not a prostitute. Well, that was sort of difficult, um, to say the least. Well, we see see that the, the Nevada County reporter, or transcript, talked about how 
successful the Chinese miners were. And this kind of publicity spread throughout the American West, and miners began to say, well, we don't want Chinese mining here because they, they can make a profit off of this. And one man said, you know, I take my laundry to the Chinaman down the street, and he doesn't charge me anything. And I found out that when he washes my shirt, gold dust falls off, and he earns, <laughs> he earns $2,000 a month off the gold dust that falls off. So, you know, there was this kind of jealousy about what was going on. And we know that the Chinese primarily did placer mining and riverbed mining. A few of them did hard rock mining, but that was much more expensive. Looking at the Truckee River area, we see that in some ways it resembles the Pearl River Delta area, with the rivers going in and out and the waterway being so important to the lives of the people in the area. The second big draw to the United States was the building of the Central Pacific Railroad. And we see that they began building this railroad in 18, they began hiring Chinese to build this railroad in 1864. Now many people say, oh no, they didn't hire them until 1865. But we have records now that show that they were hired as early as January of, 19, of 1864, and many of them, probably the first 21, and maybe even the, first, the second 50 after that, were hired from the Auburn Dutch Flat region. Why? Because seven of the board members of the Central Pacific came from Dutch Flat, and they knew the Chinese who were living there, and they said, well, you know, Joe and, and Jim, they're good. Let's hire them to work on the Central Pacific. And that's how they got hired. And they then drew in more people. And it sort of bounced further and further until eventually the Central Pacific said, we've got to get people to hire people for us. We can't do the hiring ourselves. And so they became one of the uh, major employers of Chinese and also the major importers of Chinese labor at this time in the United States. And as Gordon Chang of Stanford for university said the Chinese did an almost impossible task and it was a task that was going to end up connecting the United States from east to west, building up the western United States into an unbelievable empire and also building trade with Asia. And all of this will come about because of the first transcontinental railroad, which was followed by the second, third, and fourth transcontinental railroads. <clears throat> Who headed all of this? Charles Crocker was one of the big four. And he was the one who said, I'm going to hire the Chinese. I'm going to, and he eventually hires 12 to 20,000 of them. It's hard to count them because, first of all, their names never appear on the payroll. Their Laoban or boss or headman's name appears on the payroll. So we don't know exactly how many people worked under him. Um, and we see that, that uh, he, uh, allowed them to travel for free on the train if they worked on the construction of the train. But one of the problems of riding on the train was that certain stops like Tonopah and Verde uh, would not allow the Chinese to get off the train. But you could get on the train in Elko and go all the way to San Francisco, which one of the men I'll show you did uh, quite frequently because he had worked on the railroad. Crocker owned property in Truckee and gradually sold parcels of the land that he held to the Chinese in the area. But the main person who worked on a daily basis for the Chinese was James Strobridge. And the myth is that he opposed Crocker's hiring of the Chinese. But it's wrong if you look at his history. When he first came to California, he went into mining and failed, so he went into farming. And he hired 17 Chinese to work on his farm. And then when he was hired to build the San Francisco-San Jose Railroad in 1858, he had a man named Ah Toy work working with him from his farm, and he took Atoy with him when he was appointed to the Central Pacific. So he knew about Chinese railroad workers and probably could work with the 21 that were first hired and then the additional 50 and those after. And eventually, when he wanted to retire, Crocker said, no, you've got to come back and work on the Southern Pacific with us. And he said, well, if you get me 8,000 Chinese, I'll do it. 
And sure enough, Crocker went and got Huntington to get him 8,000 Chinese from China to work with Strobridge on building not only the southern Pacific going through the south from Arizona to Texas, but also the northern route from California into Oregon. And we see that it only took Strobridge a month before he announced publicly that the Chinese could do everything in building a railroad. And they will do this when they build their own railroad in Taishan, where one of the railroad workers came from, building the second railroad in China. Well, these men, of course, moved around. It was a, a type of job that wasn't stationary. You were always migrating from one place to another. And we see that they, they um, also built Assist, lines that connected up with the first transcontinental railroad, like the Virginia and Truckee, Carson and Colorado, Boca and Loyalton, all these little lines were part of the workers that had worked on the Central Pacific. So the old idea that once the Central Pacific was finished, all these people would be released from their jobs wasn't true because a lot of them went to work on other railroad lines, but a lot of them also came to Truckee to work in logging, and we'll go into that in a minute. Truckee was an important railroad division, so a lot of Chinese would pass through Truckee, and here we see an old picture of the um, Catholic Church, the Roundhouse, and a Roundhouse town is very important, usually well-staffed with Chinese, and also well-staffed with a Chinese cook who was paid $40 a month for keeping his restaurant open 24 hours a day. It, it was open 24 hours a day, but he knew when the trains would come through, so he only had to have workers there when the trains were coming through. And then when they didn't come through, the workers were off. And this is how they ran the, these restaurants. Um, and what we see happening is that the kind of work that they did as section hands and so forth uh, faded away as the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act forbidding forbidding laborers from entering the United States uh Left with uh, left the employers, the railroad work, uh, railroad owners, with no one to do some of the work that the Chinese did. So they had to turn to other ethnic groups like the Asian Indians and the Mexicans to do the work, and the Japanese. Well, while working for the railroads, the Chinese lived in tents, um, and here's one set tents by the railroad, or here in the summit, um, wooden houses. And these wooden houses are interesting, wooden cabins. They're on slides, and you can move them very easily from one place to another. And that was necessary if you're working on the train. Well, one of the other great myths that occurs at this time is that on May 10th, 1869, at the Golden Spike ceremony connecting the Central Pacific with the, the Union Pacific, that there were no Chinese at this ceremony. And so everybody points to this iconic picture of, oops, oh, here, I'm sorry about this. Oh, it's this iconic picture showing uh, the eating, meeting of the Central Pacific and Union Pacific, and they said, no Chinese are there, but if you look closely, here is a Chinese person. We know this because he's wearing a Darley Varton hat, which became very popular with the Chinese. They weren't always wearing straw hats. His jacket is Chinese because it's longer than a Western jacket, and he has a patch. The Chinese often patch their jackets rather than buying a new jacket. And so we have discovered three, two other people there. And we also know that Strobridge gave a party at, in his train. And he had the Chinese there. And one of them gave a speech and spoke beautiful English, which was recorded uh, in the newspaper. So it wasn't just a total loss. Well, what did the Chinese in Truckee, what did their Chinatown look like? Well, this bottom picture shows a distant view of, of the Chinatown. There were 11 merchants, including Fong Li, whom we'll talk about, woodcutters, doctors, laundrymen, and 22 prostitutes. Now, in this time period of 1870, when a census taker saw a Chinese woman, he would always say she was a prostitute, whether she was or not. 
And if it was a woman living with a group of men, she definitely was a prostitute. So I was commenting to one of my friends about the, uh, one of my friend's mothers about this, and she said when she came to the United States, she came over and lived with seven men, her husband, her brother, her brother-in-law, her cousin, you know, all these people. And she said, I had to cook and clean for them, and it was a lot of work, but I certainly wasn't a prostitute, and yet the census taker would interpret her to be. Well, looking at the assayer's office records, we see that there's property owned by several of the Chinese, including Merchant Fong Li, as well as Sisson Wallace and Company, a major Chinese labor contractor. Sisson Albert, same Sisson, but with another partner who ran stable and freighters, the Central Pacific Railroad, Charles Crocker of the Big Four, uh, and the Central Pacific. And we see that these property owners often would sell their property to the Chinese and Clark Crocker uh, later on. But they sold uh, imported teas, Chinese products, equipment, uh, they bought domestic chickens, they fed, they, all their contracted workers had to buy their food from them as well as their equipment and clothing from them. So they made a lot of money. And in fact, they said, you know, we, our Chinese eat, drink so much tea that we're gonna buy tea strictly from the wholesalers in China. And that's what they did. And that's how they could sell tea very reasonably to people who came to buy tea in their shop. They also realized that the Chinese liked pork and so when they went into Los Angeles they said, you know, you guys don't have a pork processing company. We'll partner with you if you process enough pork so that we could feed our Chinese workers. And so what we see them doing is getting into all kinds of activities uh, and being very prosperous. Sisson, when he died, well, even all of Wallace when he died were multimillionaires. Um, now we wanted I wanted to talk about Fong Li, but we have no picture of Fong Li. He was the wealthiest merchant in Truckee. But I looked at two merchants just to give you an example of what merchants look like. Sam Gibson, they, some of them took American names, especially Sam Gibson, who sold goods to uh, Dwayne Bliss, Henry Yarrington, and other uh, well-known people in the area who were not Chinese, uh, looked <coughs> dressed like this. And here is um, my favorite merchant, Ali Lake of Tuscarora, Nevada. He's wearing a silk and ermine jacket. I don't have one, but you know, I would be nice to have one. For some reason, he didn't like his wife living in Tuscarora. I think it was a little too backwards for him. But anyway, so she lived in San Francisco, which was safe. So he would ride the train to San Francisco, visit her, give a big party to anyone who was from Tuscarora in San Francisco, then go back to Tuscarora and run his merchandising store. And he was very active in the community. And we know that he read and wrote English very well because he signs a lot of legal documents in Tuscarora. Well, the Fong Lee store, now you should understand that people, Americans tended to call a Chinese person by the name of his store. It may not have been his name, but he was, he was known as Fong Li, and he sold merchandise and groceries to the entire community. Uh, his store was located near Sisson and Wallace's store, which eventually was a brick store, and that inspired him to build his store as a brick store. Um, and he, he was, he, he was, you might say, very egotistical. He liked to dress up very nicely. He always wore a big diamond ring and fancy silk clothing and, you know, was a little bit of a peacock. Uh, and so he hired two bodyguards because one time he was robbed on the street and he said, that's it, no one's going to touch me. So he hired these two disreputable guys and I think he was related to the gang leader in San Francisco called Little Pete um, because they had the same last name and he could hire hire these kinds of, um, how shall we say it, disreputable bodyguards to help him out. Uh, and you had to have a connection in order to do something like this. But anyway, Fong Li was the target of the 601 or anti-Chinese committee in, in Truckee. And they said, he's got to go and he's got to move south of the Truckee River. He said, no, if you pay me $10,000, I'll move, but I won't move otherwise. And so he stayed there and, oh, no. Oh dear. Well, anyway, he stayed there in that little 
uh, uh, intersection of uh, the streets. Well, what does it look like? What we see happening is that right after the, uh, the Central Pacific reached Reno, a lot of the Chinese were released from their jobs and they went into logging in the Reno, Truckee, Tahoe area. And why did they go into logging? Well, every little county, every little village that had a big church had a, a forest. And the people who belonged to that church would cut the wood to help earn money for the church. So when all of this rioting and flooding and famine was going on in China, they had no wood to cut. And so when they came to the United States and they were working for the railroad and cutting wood to clear the path, and they got to Truckee and Reno and they said, oh, we can cut wood here. And so what we see is about 70% of the woodcutters in the mountains around the Sierra Nevada and into the Truckee area and beyond were woodcutters. And they would work at these wood camps and you could see the denuded trees in the background. And you might say, well, it, there's a uh, Chinese man watching this tree uh, being felled in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And they used to tell me, at least the woodcutters told me, the lumbermen told me, that the Chinese would cut the tree taller than, the stumps would be taller than if a Euro-American uh, lumberman cut the tree. And so you can see this tree is, uh, the, the stump is quite high. And we think the Chinese loggers probably did that. But they also worked at the Hobart Mills, the Sierra Wood and Lumber Company. These names should all be familiar to you, I hope. Uh, here is the Verdi Company. They would send the logs into this pond that would then uh, saw, the sawmill would then saw these logs. It was great, huge, com all these sawmills were big complexes. Now, it, this one on the left is cl the Clear Creek Flume, and I worked with the Forest Service in uh, the archaeological dig of that cabin. The cabins were spaced about a mile and a half each, and the Men, two men who lived there usually were the flume tenders. The logs would go rushing down some 75 miles an hour and you had to make sure that they were not jamming up. So you bounced on the sides and you then had an instrument to move the logs down. It's a very dangerous job because you could fall in at any point and uh, that would be the end of you. Well, it was at this time that the anti-Chinese movement began to grow exponentially. It started in the 1850s with the miners, then grew and culminated in the 1869 to 1882 period, which led to the passage of the first Chinese Exclusion Act. And we see that the news media, the labor unions, which were just getting started, and the politicians began to rally crowds of people against the Chinese because they felt that they were a threat to the stability of the white man's society and livelihood. And so what we see happening is that even pioneer um, lumbermen like Ellie Ellen uh, of the Truckee Lumber Company had Chinese woodcutters and hired them and, and paid his woodcutters the same amount regardless of their ethnicity. It's how much wood you cut and that's how I pay you. And um, he paid his loaders $250 a day regardless of their ethnicity. He had a Chinese cook and when the 601 committee said you've got to get rid of all your Chinese employees, he was one of the few that staunched kept saying, no, I won't, no, I won't. But then, of course, eventually they made him and some of the others, Oliver Lonke and, and uh, so forth, uh, fire their Chinese workers. Now, you might recognize the old jailhouse, this brick building on the site of Truckee's first Chinatown. Uh, most of the lots and the land in that area had been leased from Sisson and Wallace. Um, and in May of 1875, there was fire that destroyed 40 of the Chinese buildings, as well as hogs and houses and so on and so forth. And so they were trying to persuade the Chinese to move across the river to south of the river. And what we see happening is oh, that's going the wrong direction again, is that 
the people began to say, yes, we don't want these Chinese buildings here in our midst, but you know, the Chinese Republican news owner Charles McLaughlin said uh, McLaughlin said in 1875 Truckee has this Chinese bath and now everybody can be clean and it's a wonderful thing well I don't have a picture of the bath but my grandson took a picture of the bathhouse in Calico and I imagine that that's what it looked like but now you could get a bath you know really wonderful but it led eventually to a, a, a hysteria that was not only evident in Truckee but also throughout the American West of getting rid of the Chinese, of destroying them. Um, in 1869, Unionville uh, had an anti-Chinese um, movement and they burned out Chinatown. In 1903, the labor unions burned out Reno's Chinatown and left the residents in, a, in the winter snow and starving. Fire destroyed Charkey's Chinatown in 1871, 1873, 1875, 1888, 1881, and 1882. That's a lot of fires, you know, and a lot of rebuilding, especially if you don't have insurance, which no one would insure any of the Chinese buildings. Well, Truckee then decided that they would figure out ways of getting rid of the Chinese. And this was universal throughout the American West. So Truckee started the, truck, the Trout Creek outrage, outrage in 1875, in which some seven men decided that what we should do is burn the Chinese log cabins. And here's a, oop, oop, a typical picture of a log cabin. And when they came running out, we would shoot them and hopefully kill them. Well, they killed one and wounded another. And then eventually the seven men were arrested by the um, police, the sheriff, and brought to trial. But you see, in, in trials at this time, the Chinese testimony could not be accepted as being truthful. They could not testify against a white. So since there were no witnesses or acceptable testimony, they did testify, but it wasn't acceptable, then all the seven men uh, were released. So they moved to the other side of, of the river, and this is what the new Chinatown looked like, the second Chinatown that you're going to de um, dedicate. So you can see here's the, <coughs> here's the river and here is new Chinatown, and the yellow indicates the buildings that the Chinese occupied south of the river. The new Chinatown had 700 residents. We don't know if that's really an accurate number, but about 700. And of course, once again, um, Fong Li was the richest person, but there were several others who were also also very wealthy. There were also doctors, miners, laundrymen, cooks, farmhands, railroad workers, probable work, railroad workers, gardeners, jewelers, scavengers, peddlers, butcher, maid, housewives. It's strange to have in this time period someone designating a Chinese woman as a housewife because it usually didn't happen. But because one of them had a child, uh, they had decided that she was a, a bona fide uh, housewife. And then there were opium den owners, prostitutes, gamblers, and so on. And there was also one Chinese company that was that owned a lumber ranch, or a wood ranch, they were called at this time, as well as personal property, and that's how he ends up in the assessor's office. And we see that the men who knew how to build railroads helped build narrow gauge lines to get lumber companies to get their lumber to the railroad stations, as well as getting minerals from the mines to the railroad stations so that it could be sent throughout the United States and sometimes throughout the world. So here is a Chinese herb shop that still stands from a 1930s picture. And you can see that a nice car stands in front of it, which means his customer had to be have some money because he had a car. Well, why would you go to a Chinese herb store? Well, oftentimes they were the only doctors in town, or if they were not, as many white men diaries or white women diaries show. The Chinese herbs worked on them and cured them of their illness. Mrs. Leland Stanford being one of the prime examples of an illness being cured by a Chinese herb doctor. And so it was very popular to go to a Chinese herbalist. And if you go to a mining camp, you often find examples of this anti-diarrhea medication scattered throughout the camp because apparently uh, this was a problem among miners. And 
And so we know that Chinese herbs were spread not only into Chinese communities, but non-Chinese communities, even Native American communities. Well, in this period of, of anti-Chinese hysteria, we see that other towns decided that they were going to invent ways of getting rid of the Chinese. So the Eureka method, which started before the Truckee method, um, started in February of 1885. And they, what they did was they decided to get rid of their Chinese and send them to San Francisco. And the residents actually bought boat tickets to send the Chinese to San Francisco. And if the, the Chinese weren't going to go, they said, we'll hang them. And they built gallows with effigies of Chinese to persuade the Chinese that they had better get out of there. Um, and so this is what Eureka's Chinatown looked like in 1885, and a typical laundryman standing in front of his laundry. In Rock Springs, Wyoming, was one of the worst uh, Chinese um, massacres of the time. There were 300, 700 Chinese workers working for the Union Pacific in coal mines. 40% of the men there were named Leo, being part of that one clan, and um, there were 28 killed and many wounded and many lost property, way beyond the amount that was covered by the indemnity. The Chinese who lived there never got the indemnity money as far as uh, I learned. And so what we see is, you know, everything gets destroyed and you have nothing, you have to build from the beginning, and it's a very sad life. In Tacoma, Washington, they invented a method, and the citizens decided that the Chinese had to leave on a train or a wagon to Portland, and then Portland is going to have an anti-Chinese movement too. And so what they did was they torched Chinatown so that they couldn't come back to Tacoma, uh, and the men who torched Chinatown were arrested, but again, uh, they were let go and found not guilty. So the anti-Chinese movement reaches new heights in 1886, and what we see happening is that the anti-Chinese men began to gather, and they represent different regions, and they held this huge conference, and our old friend Charles McLaughlin was elected president of this organization, and the end result of their conference was the Chinese must go. And they subscribed to the same statement that the labor unions did, we've got to get rid of the Chinese. Now, you might say, if he praised the Chinese for having a, a wash house, why would he now turn against them? Well, by this time, he had learned that he wanted to be in politics, number one. Number two, that the Chinese didn't vote, and he could gather more voters if he he took an anti-Chinese stance, and he did actually gather more supporters because of his stance. And so what we see happening then is he begins to devise the Truckee method, and he proposes in his newspaper that this is a peaceful, orderly, and lawful method. Of course, if you destroy property, that's not necessarily lawful. If you physically harm Chinese, it's not really lawful. Uh, but he did successfully boycott Chinese businesses, <laughs> firms that employed Chinese, and any store that sold Chinese products. And so with this, the Truckee method became very, very popular. And he, of course, being a newspaper man, was able to spread the idea of the method to many other towns that began to adopt the Truckee method of getting rid of the Chinese. The last holdouts in Truckee were Crocker and company, Sisson and Wallace, uh, and what we see happening is that after the Truckee method was announced and successful, or they claimed it was successful, we'll have to ask about that in a minute, um, there were large anti-Chinese movements, or some people call it hysteria, throughout California as 40 towns began to have violent movements. Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon, all of these places began to drive the Chinese out of their region. Oh, going the wrong way. And 
so we ask, well, where did the Chinese from Truckee go? Well, we really don't know. But looking in the newspaper, I came across, you know, I have nothing to do but read newspapers. I came across this newspaper in 1888 uh, that said that in Oroville, the brick store of Fong Li was damaged by a fire. And I said, now how many Chinese merchants named Fong Li would build a brick merchandise store except for the Fong Li of Truckee? And sure enough, the probability is very high that it was one and the same person. Now, why would he move to Oroville? Well, Oroville was next to a, a little mining town that brought in millions of dollars. And it got to be so, po and they, they took their recreation in nearby Oroville, and they donated so much money or sent so much money home that the emperor of China sent them this um, bronze urn in 1870, in 1877 or something like that, and also donated to their museum. So if you ever go to Oroville, you see you will see some very beautiful 18th, 19th century porcelains, jades, and costumes uh, because of the emperor's favor of the very wealthy Chinese in Oroville. Well, what about the Chinese who were working in logging? Well, we don't really know what happened happened to them. We do know that by, 18, by 1900 there were two Chinese in, still living in Truckee. But we look to an 1890 photograph of Chinese woodcutters in the, in the Tahoe region and we think some of them just simply vanished into the mountains to work in wood ranches just as they had in Truckee. Well, the anti-Chinese movement, you know, spread to other places, and we see that in, even as late as 1903, uh, the labor unions tried to get rid of all the Chinese in Tonopah. That wasn't a good idea because the founder of Tonopah, Jim Butler, liked the Chinese, and though they were the anti-Chinese agitators were successful in killing one man, uh, Chong Bing Lung, uh, a laundryman who'd lived in the United States for some 30 years, they could couldn't get rid of uh, Mrs. Billy Ford here with her two sons because she was protected by uh, Euro-American families. And this is what also was common that people don't talk about. Families liked the certain Chinese and would protect them from the anti-Chinese mobs. And, and we see that the Chinese weren't quiet about being angry about being kicked out. And so in Eureka, they sued the city of Eureka. But Eureka claimed, and all the newspaper accounts claimed that the Eureka method was very successful. And then when you looked at this lawsuit and looked at what happened, they found out that there was a man named Tom Blair who protected his Chinese worker uh, against the anti-Chinese agitators. And when Blair died, Charlie Moon raised the, the Blair children. He married and he had children. And his great, 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 I always get all the greats wrong, granddaughter uh, still lives in Eureka. So we see that, no, they didn't kick out all of the Chinese, although she's not fully Chinese, she's partially Chinese. And we see that, that survivors occurred, here's Charlie Moon, uh, even in uh, Rock Springs, Wyoming. So here's the Leo, Mrs. Leo, who uh, died in 2018, and her son finally moved to Los Angeles, and this is how I got her picture. You know, you have to get around to getting pictures of people for these kinds of talks. And what we see happening is that the Leo clan stayed in Rock Springs through all these generations from uh, the Rock Springs massacre to the present. One of the reasons that was attractive to the Chinese was that they could own land in various ways. Land ownership was very important to them in China. And we see that they could own forest land in Nevada, which borders around California and they did. They won a lawsuit in 1883 on this and therefore were able to purchase wood ranches around the Truckee Tahoe area. And we see that, that one of the things they specialized in was cutting core wood. Core wood is four feet high, eight inches long and four feet deep. So there's a pile of core wood that's oh, Oh dear, that's 
over 100 years old. And this is Tai Singh, who was the cook for Stephen Mather, who created um, Yosemite as a national park. And here he is cutting core wood. And he, he becomes a very famous cook, and they even name a peak uh, after him. Now, what is core wood? What is wood charcoal? Well, the Chinese have known about how to make wood charcoal since the 17th century BC. And this is an old woodblock print showing you how to do it. If you didn't know how to do it, you could figure out by looking at the picture and, and recreating it. But you see it's a rectangular and then a uh, half circle kind of thing. And it has to be tended. And so in 2000, Dr. Susan Lindstrom, one of the archaeologists here, found 150 to 300 of these wood charcoal kilns near Truckee. It's in Glenwood, I think. Oh, Greenwood. And she was able to preserve one of these in this residential area. But this was an interesting whole phenomenon, for they provided the wood charcoal not only for the railroad and the mines, but also for the homes and for cooking and for all sorts of things. You think of all the reasons why you want heat, like there's no heat here, um, you know, and that, that goes to prove why you need this wood charcoal. Well, one of the interesting things, of course, that has happened in recent decades is that archaeologists have given us, given us insights into the Chinese, their lives, their histories, and what they have done. One of the bad things is that prior to 1980, Chinese American archaeologists didn't look at the American finds that they found at the sites, but focused only on the Chinese things like these shards of, of Chinese porcelain. They found an intact walk. This, the, the oh, oh, no, going the wrong way. No, going the wrong way. The, the charcoal in the center is what Susan Lindstrom and I found, you know, walking around this area. And it, it, we see that it, 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 these things are still left and floating around here in this area richly. Well, Chinese uh, leaders had to be aware of the immigration laws, and they had to know what the 1882, 1892, 1902, 1924 acts did. But essentially, it closed the great gate of Chinese immigration, and we don't see Chinese coming into the United States in any, any significant numbers, really until 1970. But the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943. And what that did was allow families to be reunited. So from 1943 until 1970, the majority of new immigrants from China were women joining their husbands or their sons or their daughters who were living in the United States. We see that the population um, begins to decline, and it won't be until 1970 that you get a ratio of one every one Chinese man to every one Chinese woman. Now, it was better to live in 1880 because you had 300 men to every Chinese woman. That's a better ratio. But you know, you can't have everything. Uh, and we see that the Chinese and their accomplishments are being recognized in recent times. And this is, I think, a great movement forward. And so we have the uh, Board of Supervisors of the County of Nevada declaring this landmark status. And I really commend the Truckee Historical Society and all those who participated in this, Truckee's Chinatown's designation. Uh, and so with this, I will close and I want to thank all of the people who helped in this uh, presentation. And if there are any questions that you'd like to ask, feel free. You can read my two books. Um, the Chinese in the Woods is now going to be at the Chinese Historical Society. And it does talk about trains and Truckee and so forth. And um, anytime you have any questions that you think of afterwards, there's my email. It's really easy to remember. All you have to do is remember my name, put a dot in front of my first name, uh, and Gmail. Everybody knows Gmail. So it's easy to contact me. And thank you for your attention.
our presentation for tonight. But if some folks want to um, stick around and ask some questions, we can we can do that. But I also know some folks need to go, so don't feel bad if they kind of get up and, and walk walk out. Uh, but we can open the floor up to to some questions if, if we have some time. Yeah. Okay. Um, right here. Um, I've known you. I talked to you about 20 years ago. The biggest question I have. And Phil Sexton and I talked about this, is when is the federal government going to do a monument to these people? We have a place called the China Wall on the summit. UP owns that land, and that's where the majority of the Chinese die. Um, do you have any political pull or... Okay. What is going on right now is that the 1882 Foundation, based in Washington, D.C., has applied for the summit tunnels to be a national monument, and if not a national historic landmark. Great. And they have Barbara Wyeth of the National Park Service, retired, working with them to achieve this. Um, it was supposed to take place this fall, but because of the backlog, because of COVID, it won't happen hopefully sometime next year or the year after, but there will be a designation of the summit tunnels to honor the Chinese workers who created this tunnel. It was absolutely an unbelievable task. I mean, they were lucky if they could move an inch a day. Uh, yeah, an inch One a day. caveat you should know, Phil Sexton says there is a photo of them building the China Wall mm -hmm. with a Derek Crane, and I don't know if you've seen that picture or not, but Phil says it's a negative, and they, I just thought for you, you might want to get a picture of that, because there's not many pictures of that in that area. But right, you know. and I learned how to, you just don't build the China dig and get it exactly what they're looking for right you know with the words and everything so I had a grant writer and she took three classes in grant writing she got me all the grants I wanted it was wonderful <laughs> yes what happened in 1970 why you had all of the, uh, the the changes in immigration change in immigration law and the immigration law of 1865 opened the door but slowly these things open the door but slowly and so we see people now beginning to come in uh, under different regulations and so you have the influx of more people and so from 18, 1970 on you get um, a lot of scientists, a lot of skilled technicians because they have a special visa, the H visa to come in and so you get a what we call a more educated class of Chinese coming in. So it changes the whole nature of what Chinatowns are like. Yes? How did the role of religion play with Oh, sorry. Keeping the Chinese people alive and moving, motivated and moving forward. How, how did they? The role of religion. Okay, the role of religion. Religion that were brought over from China. Yeah. Play. Yeah, it, it's a religion is a very funny thing because what happened in, in 1877 is that the Congress did an investigation of the Chinese and Chinese immigration and they decided that all Chinese were Buddhists. Okay. <laughs> And <laughs> I, I know. And so you see newspapers and articles and pictures and movies and popular literature saying that the Chinese are Buddhists. Now, if you go to China and you say to somebody, are you Buddhist? You know, the chances that you would find someone who is Buddhist, who is not in a Buddhist community, are so rare. But anyway, so we believed in the late 19th century that the Chinese were Buddhists and therefore they were not Christian and therefore they should be discriminated against on the basis of religion uh, and, and that they were heathens and that's where you get the heathen Chinese label and then they decided Confucianism was a religion because the word in Confucian ideology for 
revering your ancestors, respecting your ancestors, respecting your elders. You know, this is what one of my friends who used to own the uh, casino in, in Las Vegas said. He said, if I could only teach my sons this. Anyway, <laughs> respect your elders. Yeah. He said, but what the Americans translated that word is, you worship your ancestors. And so therefore, Confucianism is, is a religion. And I argue that's not what was being done. So that's a big anthropological argument. <laughs> yes? Um, you mentioned early on that there, were, uh, there was quite a commerce of Chinese sending goods back to China from America. And uh, a lot of them were American goods that wound up in China. But I wonder, has there been any research into letters sent back uh, to China from Chinese Americans that describe from the Chinese point of view what was going on here, what was really going on. Very, very few of them could be kept because the paper would disintegrate. You know, it, it, Canton is a humid area, and you know, unless you really work to preserve it, it, it doesn't get preserved. But some things were preserved, and we do know about some lives of the women or the people that were left behind. And then we had, in the Stanford Railroad Project, we found one man who had nine generations. He came over as a Central Pacific Railroad worker. He went back, sent his son over. Son went back, he sent his son over. And for nine generations, the family has continued to come to the United States. And the family has continued to send money back home. And they have continued to keep up the home that they had back in China until the present day. And the home is really rather nice. We got invited in, you know, for tea and cookies. I'm always welcome, I'm always able to go to tea and cookies. Uh, but, you know, it, whereas the Henry Yup's home fell into disintegration. When his wife and daughter moved to Reno, uh, and the brother said, I'm not going to take care of this huge house. I've got two identical homes, three stories high. He said, forget it. We're moving. And he was older, and so he moved, he and his wife moved to a little retirement home, and the house fell into disrepair, and I saw that too. I asked the Yup children, there are 10 of them, and many of them are doctors and dentists, if they would donate some money to make the home a museum, because it was still in good condition. Good condition, but deteriorated, and they wouldn't. So, you know, there goes the home. There were also Chinese language like I said, out of San Francisco, do you think any of those have survived from that era? Yeah, I, yeah you don't know. You know, it, I go around and sometimes I do meet, as I was telling one of the people here, um, I met the Leo family <laughs> just by accident in Los Angeles, and so I could tell the Leo story as a result of that. Yes. What was the common currency that was set back before? Money was sent back. Yeah. What was the oh, okay. Well, first, and, and part two, how was money wired? Okay. Yes. At first, good old Wells Fargo did the did the job. Okay, but pretty soon the Chinese said. Why should Wells Fargo do it? We can do it ourselves. So they started what they called transfer uh, uh, companies. And they would then collect the money here in San Francisco, send it to Hong Kong, and then take a profit, and then send it to the village. You know. And so there, there were profit makers all along in that what system. Yeah, what's the denomination? Oh, any, any denomination. Um, one man I'm studying, when he first came over as a young child, uh, he sent one dollar to his mother whenever he could save a dollar. And by the time he became a labor contractor, he was sending her five dollars every other month. So, you know, it depended on what you did. Now, then there were those very wealthy Chinese who wouldn't send mommy anything, you know. So, you know, it, it's your personality. Yeah. The greenback was going to be much good in Shanghai, I guess. Right, they have dollars here, but they don't have dollars. Oh, oh, yeah, it's transferred into Chinese money. So they, they, they have an exchange. So yeah. It's already established. Oh, any bank did it. Yeah, and it, it, it's very funny because I even have American dollars transferred into Chinese dollar certificates. 
you know. So it's all bank, bank to bank type so thing. Yeah, it's all established by bankers. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. Tell me about China Cook. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. Oh, good. We're so grateful that you made the trip up here. So, <laughs> okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. We thank really you. appreciate your oh, coming. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much.